to moderate this session, we have Dr. Akin, Akin Bello. Have a great time. Now I need to know why you're laughing. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. If you're not answering me well, we won't go on. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. So one more time, can we put our hands together for our panelists? All right, so this is a serious um, conversation from yesterday. We had a whole lot um, that we spoke about in the keynote sessions yesterday and the breakout rooms. And all we just wanted to achieve is a sustainable, fit for purpose, education. So we appreciate the deputy governor and all protocols duly extended. So we, we spoke about a few things yesterday and the commissioner did a recap of, uh, she gave a communique of what we talked about yesterday. So we have people from different industries and different spheres of influence. And so we want to look at how this connects and how we get to the place of effective implementation. So, I would first run an introduction of all our panelists. So, I would like them to say a few things about themselves and as it connects to the subject that we are discussing. And the first person I would like to call is the person online, uh, Mr. Chineze. Can we put our hands together for him? <laughs> so, can you hear me, Mr. Chineze? Hello. Good morning, Chinese. Can you hear me? Okay, we'll put in audio. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to sort you out real quick. Okay, so um, next is um, Dr. Ogun Saya. Uh, we want you to do an introduction of yourself and um, do a little um, talk about Feed for Purpose Education the next one minute. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Is it working now? I'm uh, Olufemi Ogunsoya, as I've been introduced. I'm an educator. I run a sixth-term college called Oxbridge Tutorial College that was founded 29 years ago. We're going to be 30 next year. So I deal with teenagers. Uh, they're the most interesting group of children to me. And um, I'm also the chairperson of the Council of Private Associations, Private Schools Associations in Lagos State, called COPSAIL. It was put together by um, the commissioner a few years back. Right, we've been talking about fit for purpose education, and today we want to look at the strategies and the sustainability. We've spoken a lot, the audacity and the um, royal highness from Worry gave us a very, very interesting um, presentation as well. Let me refer to that. But I'm coming from the perspective, she spoke a lot also about teachers. And I'm going to be speaking about teachers as the very first point of reference that we need to focus on. It's a laudable thing that the Lagos State Government has done in the um, sector of education. A lot of innovation, a lot of introductions, a lot of creativity. And it's interesting that uh, teachers who are qualified are now being employed into the system. But it shouldn't stop there. Because the training of the teacher, learning from the Finnish uh, background, they lay a lot of emphasis on pedagogy. And that's where I'm coming in this morning. Pedagogical skills for our teachers. The Finnish teachers go through five years of preparation for pedagogical studies. 
uh, for them to be able to learn the art and science of teaching and educational methods. So that by the time they get into the classroom, they are actually change agents themselves and they can teach the t uh, children all about change and about self-expression, the critical thing. Everything is now translated into the classroom. So it's not short trainings, it's intentional, yeah. continuous training. The consistency of ensuring that teachers are taken through this training. And I'm happy that we now have a university of education that can now be on the front burner of whatever is being done at that university. The pedagogical skills are key because like we heard, the teachers who stand in front of the children in our classrooms are the ones who mold their future. So you want to put teachers there who can contribute positively to the molding of the lives of the children. And pedagogy is very key. Yes, we might be addressing it in different ways at the moment, but we need to redefine and re restructure to ensure that it's on the front burner and that teachers, even the existing ones, go through a minimum of one year of training. That would be my recommendation. The other aspect that, needs, that we need to also pay a lot of attention to, somebody spoke about value-based education yesterday. Mine is borrowing from the uh, South Korean um, model where they teach moral education and character education as part of their curriculum. I know that the deputy governor was saying, how do we change the curriculum since we're all participating in the same exam? But the teaching of moral and character education is so key because intelligence plus character, that is the only true education. Without the character aspect, Amazing. Without the character aspect, I see education without character is mere intelligence, and anybody can be intelligent. But the character aspect is so key that we need to hone in and ensure that it's embedded as part of our curriculum, so that a lot of, in a place like South Korea, because they teach them tenacity, don't give up, resilience, 97% of students who go through secondary education progress to university. So they must be getting something right with that aspect of the moral and the social uh, character development of the children. Wow, Thank you. fantastic. I'll put our hands together for her. She said two major things there, the pedagogic school skills and character development. I'm gonna come back to you on that. There's a whole lot to say as part of strategies that we are trying to go towards. But let's get Chinese now. Do we have Mr. Chinese online? Good morning, just testing the mic. How's this working? It's working, it's working perfectly well. well. How, How are you today? today? I'm well, thank you for allowing me to join you guys this way. This is, it's a real uh, privilege to be able to join this session and to join the other panelists and all who are gathered. So thank you for the opportunity. Fantastic, we're delighted. So what a, um, a little introduction about you and just tell us about what you do, how it connects with um, creating a fit for purpose model of education. Sure. As you mentioned earlier, I, I'm, I'm part of a team that leads uh, Nova Pioneer Education Group. We are a school group, a uh, pan-African school group founded to develop innovators and leaders who would shape the African century. And we currently uh, operate uh, 14 going on 16 schools across South and East Africa, and we hope uh, in years to come to serve in West Africa as well. Um, the why of what we, why innovators and leaders is because our, our thesis and belief is that um, we need to develop schools uh, in, that create outcomes and experiences for young people that develop them as shapers. Uh, the, our, set, our firm belief is that across the continent, our potential superpower is our, is our youth, our human capacity. And, but if we don't uh, do well by them and their developments, they're also, it also is uh, potentially a, a, you know, a very destructive path ahead of us. And so we really believe by developing the, the, those skills to shape the skills to shape, and we, we talk about three C's. Character, as the previous panelist, uh, my friend just mentioned. Um, competence, uh, particularly collaborative problem solving capabilities, and connection, social, social capital across students, um, a connectivity to, to community and to each other. And by developing those three things, we can develop uh, positive young shapers who can really power the, what we call the African century. Now, perhaps more, perhaps most importantly, uh, uh, to, in terms of my contribution to this conversation, is our how. What is at the core of, of how we think about doing that consistently, uh, excellently across schools 
uh, in, a, in a sustainable way. And I think there are really uh, three, three things at the center of our, uh, sort of our core strategy, and that is uh, culture, uh, uh, practice, when I say practice, I mean pedagogy and curriculum. And I list those in descending order of importance in my view. Curriculum, certainly important, and we, and we, we invest in a central learning design to support not just core, sort of core traditional curriculum aspects, but also um, uh, entrepreneurial and leadership development and a range of what we call our hallmark programs. So that's important, and how we design learning to be inquiry-based is important, so curriculum is important. But even more important than that, and I sort of put it in a, I don't know, arbitrarily in an 80-20 ratio or 70-30 ratio, is pedagogy. And, um, and this gets to teacher pra yeah, instructional practice, teaching and learning in classrooms. And, and I think what, it, you know, to the extent that we have time in this panel, I'd love, I'd love to really, my, my, my key contribution to this to be, and is what I has found to be our most powerful, uh, our most powerful strategy for consistently strong practice is building, um, is in classroom professional development, con a consistent practice of a col collaborative professional practice in which you have, um, uh, you build an apprenticeship model of learning and we have systematic coaching and development by instructional leaders in classrooms, in, in schools. So we're building capacity systematically. We're not counting on the uh, individually gifted teacher. We're not uh, uh, pay, having to go out and poach and, and, and seek out uh, and, and hire just in the, 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 the one in a million type of teacher, but we're systematically building the capacity for great instruction in, in a large number of education committed and passionate uh, educators. And then underpinning all of that, and in this I think is, is, is probably the, even more important to the sustainability of that kind of practice is culture. And um, you know, it's, it is our, our, our first and founding strategy has always been culture. And, and when I say culture, I mean a culture of high expectations, a culture of uh, accepting feedback and coaching, what we call always growing. And without these kind of uh, a culture of greater together and servant leadership, and without a very explicit and consistent culture, there, I, there's certainly no way we can, or I don't think any large group of schools or school systems can uh, systematically and consistently develop, uh, get better, get better over time. Uh, because you have to, you have to want someone in your classroom uh, observing and helping you grow. You have to be growth oriented, and and without that, we, we certainly wouldn't uh, be able to progress. So, um, culture first, uh, pedagogy second, curriculum third, and trying to do that as best as we possibly can systematically is how we tr strive to create the experiences and outcomes for students across our schools, and we think it has relevance for others as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together for Chinese. Uh, that, that qualifies for a, a keynote address. But we're still coming back to the strategies. Thank you very much for that. So let me just move to my um, close right here. I want um, our excellency, the ambassador um, for education in Finland, I want to do an introduction and how it connects. I know you've given a speech, but just we'll just have it short this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm ambassador for education uh, based at the foreign ministry uh, for Finland in Helsinki. I'm not with the education ministry, I'm at the foreign ministry. And this is because we feel that, that really Finland wants to play its role globally in terms of supporting learning. And, 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 and that it goes without saying that sharing of these practices from Finland and, and engaging in a dialogue with all partners globally also to learn from each other is, is, is key also for our foreign affairs. Um, and then I'd like to make three points that I, I think are, are key, and I, I, I said them in my speech already, but I'd just like to underline the importance. Firstly, the increased investment for education, because this is in, investment in education is, is key if we want to, to have good outcomes. And in Finland, we do not see education just as a budget cost, because we see it as as an investment for the future. Without education, there's really nothing. There is an, uh, the, a country cannot be sustainable. There's no competitiveness. Um, there's no, it cannot uh, be a resi resilient society. So education is an investment for future. And we also see that if we give a bit more um, autonomy at local level, schools level, uh, cities level, to decide 
um, uh, on, on the funding, how they use the funding, it motivates them and it, it improves the learning outcomes. So this is one. Second, it's the teachers, and as Her Royal Highness also really made a key point on, on the teachers, teachers are at the core of, of, of any kind of learning. So, so it, uh, teachers need to be motivated, uh, they need to have the competencies required. In Finland, they all have master's degree, and it's not only on the subject related matter, but it, it, it's a lot about pedagogy, how to teach. This, this is key for, 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 for them. And they also need to be supported at their work. So they need to be supported in order for them to, to, to put the children um, at the center of learning. And we have various kinds of tutoring programs and, and continuous training for teachers as well. Third point is the relevance of education. And this is something that globally we all have the same challenge. What, what is the future of education? What kind of skills are needed for, for in, in the future? Uh, and, 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 uh, and also so that we don't only um, teach uh, kids uh, for the tests, for the exams. We teach them to, for life, for work. And this is really key, I wow. think. Thank you. Fantastic. Did you hear the last point? We we'll teach them for life. That, I, I think that, that's really important. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency. So let me just move straight to um, Dr. Tunde Adekola, Senior Education Specialist, World Bank Nigeria. A brief introduction on how it connects to the subject matter. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is um, Tunde Adekola. I'm senior education specialist with the World Bank Group and based in Nigeria. Um, let me start by saying since Lagos is a center of excellence, hub of excellence in Nigeria, so I'm not just only talking about uh, fit for purpose, but let's start talking about excellent and best fit for purpose. And part of it is what Lagos is already doing. Spending is quite different from investment. And I think the Finland people uh, said it, the ambassador. You may be spending money, but you are not investing. So what we are talking now is how Lagos continue to invest smartly and wisely. And these are the five critical areas I've been listening since yesterday. You just continue to do what you know how to do first. The first is not in the order of priority, but the first one I have here is teacher professional development. You should continue to develop invest in your teachers. Why? If you are spending 80% of your resources on your teachers, then are you getting 80% of results? So we need to make sure we align our resources to the type of result that we want. The second one, which is also very important, digital literacy and skills, digital skills is critical. Why? Because your teachers, your students, everybody, it should be inclusive, which is part of what we help Lagos to confront the type of issues we are now having in Africa and Nigeria, which is learning crisis. We need to make our education more equitable. Your location, your gender, the type of uh, uh, background you have should not be a barrier to achieve what you want. And of course, I think uh, Ruya and I said, early childhood, the better you start very early to invest in your children, the returns at the later life is very, very high. Another one, number four, which is very dear to us in the World Bank, is technical and vocational training and skills development. We need to invest in our youth because at the end of the day, some of these challenges that we are facing, either by migration from Nigeria or the type of uh, systemic issue we have in security with skill development. And it's not enough to provide technical and vocational for our youth in Nigeria. We have to connect our knowledge skills to the global knowledge and information. And that can only be done by strengthening the national skills qualification framework so that by the time you say you are a carpenter or you're a mechanic, and you go to Finland, they know where level you are. So we have to connect what we are doing in Lagos State, or master craftsman, 
on all those skills to the global knowledge. And the last one you continue to do is language, literacy, and learning. There's a correlation between language, literacy, and learning. And luckily for human beings, we talk before we go to school. So everything starts from home. The only thing we cannot do when we get to school, we cannot write what we speak, or we cannot read what we see. So school is continuous with what we have in home. So I want to say by we need value added type of conversation into what Lagos is already doing and to continue to do what you are doing consistently. But remember, whatever you cannot measure or assess, you cannot improve. You need to measure where you are, what you are doing, and continue to see how to improve on it. And lastly, we need a coalition. Lagos State alone cannot do it. Private sector alone cannot do it. Development partners alone cannot do it. We need a coalition of all those people who are interested in Lagos State in education of our children so that we'll be able to have a very focused, better outcome, linking results to results, and align our results to the incentives. Because any society, in those who work like elephants, it's like ants. And those who work like ants, it's like elephants. If you organize this type of program, it will not work. So we just have to continue to incentivize our teachers to be able to hold them accountable. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Tunde Adekolam. This passes for a master class. All right, so I move straight to um, the special advisor on sustainable development goals and investment to the government of Lagos State, Mrs. Sholakwe Hammond. I won't call you what you want me to call you, Mrs. <laughs> Sholakwe Hammond. You know, she's going to do a little introduction, and um, I mean, there's a whole lot of connection between this and what she does, a whole lot. The table. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, and uh, congratulations again to everyone. It's been very exciting following this since yesterday. And I think pretty much everyone has said um, most of the things I would, you know, I literally had to say. So let me start with the introduction, as you know, I like to follow instructions. I'm a trained economist. I've worked in banking. I've worked in management consulting, strategy consulting. I've worked in financial advisory. I've worked in startup um, ecosystem um, enablement. And now I'm a politician <laughs> and a government uh, policymaker, as it were. And I hunt for money for Lagos State. So this is a very interesting background. So I think I've pretty much been in almost all the shoes that are around this table. And, and what that says to me, and I must also lay the background. Uh, my grandfather was a teacher. My great uncle was a teacher. My father was a lecturer. My mother was a teacher and a principal. My father's four sisters are teachers. And so, you know, this is my home. <laughs> of all the SDGs, I mean, there's some that obviously are important because they're existential, but for me, education is not just existentially important, but really has my heart. It's been all I've known since, you know, I've, since birth. Um, and so it's very, very important, and I can't speak to how important the sector is, um, you know, enough. Uh, and sitting, looking, listening to everyone, um, again, as I said, since yesterday, the one thing that, or two things are very clear. There's a lot of knowledge in this room. Everyone pretty much knows the best practices, the great things that need to be done. The second thing that has seemed very clear to me is no one seems to disagree about what needs to be done. We're all very, very clear about what should be done. And indeed, I think, I hope over the course of the last year and a half or so, in Lagos, we've been able to showcase um, not just our desire, not just our knowledge, but our efforts. In some, time, in some cases, fledgling, and in some cases, you know, we've gotten a bit more experience, but our desire expressed through our actions over the last at least um, three decades, if not um, more, to walk in this direction of excellence. Um, so all I hear, the only thing I hear is more. And that's really why I'm excited about the role that I play. My job is not just to find funding and partnerships and support for all these aspirations that Lagos has as a state, 
but also to ensure that we are trying to deliver on the SDGs, which is the framework that we've chosen to measure. So again, that speaks to the piece everyone had talked about around data and around measuring outcomes. I spent five years of my life implementing performance management systems, and we all know the well-known adage, what you do not measure, you cannot manage. And so this is something that's very important for us as a state. So if we all know where we want to go, and as has been the point, I think it was Dr. Adekola that made the point, and he's a terrible person to follow, by the way. He literally read everything I have on my mind. <laughs> but it's fine, it's great hearing it. It sounds better coming from you. Um, I think uh, he, he made a point um, around, like, government cannot fund this alone. Um, the private sector cannot fund this alone. Development partners cannot fund this alone. It takes all of us coming together to work together to deliver on these outcomes. Um, it takes all of us supporting the educators that we know. It takes all of us investing in research. It takes all of us um, working to foster that culture. And I love what Chimese said about culture first. Um, I, one, I know Mr. Deputy Governor in particular is a very ardent um, champion of values, bringing values back, and the role the family plays in um, education. And the fact that, as um, Prof said, uh, Professor Ogusoya said, you can teach them everything you like. In fact, I don't think they will be intelligent. I think they will be merely literate. I don't think you can be intelligent if you don't have the values and the character to go with what you are learning and to implement properly. So our role is really to help to communicate the willingness, the eagerness of the state to partner, and I think, I honestly have to say, of all the agencies, I think the Ministry of Education has done that phenomenally well. I think both the Commissioner and the Special Advisor deserve a round of applause. This is not just new, but it just has been increasing over time. When you see the number of partnerships that they've been able to form, and with everyone, so it's big companies, it's small companies, it's technological companies, it's every, everybody, organizations, individuals, Whoever it is, they are ready and willing to work, and I think it must be commended. I think that's a great starting point. It, sh it shows the spirit of Lagos for collaboration, and I think that really is, is, is what is most important. We've talked today, everyone knows what needs to be done. I haven't heard any disputes about the direction we should be heading in, about the initiatives we should be undertaking. Most of those things are things that we're already working on. So it's how do we create a framework for collaboration? And I think for me, it's three ingredients. Once the knowledge is there, it's really about interest. And it's very heartwarming and exciting to see all the interest in this room. We're very grateful to our friends in Finland, especially the city of Tampere. We know they've been very strong partners and we see a lot of our other partners in this room who are willing to work with us. The second then is a framework for accountability. And I think that's also something we've done really well. Um, I know we had, we've had a series of, 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 of um, initiatives with the Ministry of Education at our office, uh, working with Minister, Commissioner for Education and the um, Executive Secretary of Last Verb, for example. We had a, a, it was literally a session with um, the European Chamber of Commerce at which five of their companies committed to supporting education. Um, and we have two that are on the verge of signing partnership agreements with us. So that framework is already there. Um, so it's interest, it's a framework for collaborating and then reporting on accountability. It's very important to measure outcomes. And that's something else that Dr. Adekola said that I love. It's not about spending, it's about investment. And what's the difference between that? An investment delivers a desired outcome. It's important that we are measuring outcomes. And I think if you see how we've been reporting things in Lagos, you know, the commission, we're not, we're, we talk about how, what we spend on. We don't necessarily talk about how much we spend. We talk, we'll talk about what we spend on. But more importantly, we're tracking what that is delivering, what that means in outcomes. And I think that's what is most important. So I think, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, let me thank not deliver thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you would agree with me that all the panelists here are erudite scholars. You would agree with me. So let's go to the real deal, which is actually, we're talking about strategies for implementation. So we can speak about a lot of these things. We all know the models that have worked. I mean, so you know a few things that, were, that has worked in Nigeria. You know, we are not where we used to be. You know, we know where we are. So then everything that we are talking about, 
So we want to talk about these designs. You talked about plans. You talked about policies. You talked about specification. You talked about standard. You know, how, what are the strategies for achieving this? And I'm going to go straight with Chinese on this. How do we streamline all of this into a strategy? Chinese, are you still with us? I've been listening. Uh, first of all, let me test my audio. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. Great. Yeah, I, I've been listening listen to the conversation. Uh, you know, the, I think the, it's, a, it's a truism uh, in education that you can't shift outcomes without shifting uh, classroom practice, right? And so the question is, what's, what's a strategy or approach that can do that systematically across a large number of classrooms uh, uh, and shape a culture of continuous improvement in our, in our teaching and learning? And if I would, you know, if what I, I think the greatest uh, point of intervention uh, for uh, practical intervention that we have, uh, we I have found in our, in our schools, and I think this would apply across a, a much larger system uh, with uh, you know varied resources, whether they are uh, uh, lower resources or even higher resources, is um, is to invest in, in in school instructional leadership, for to have school leaders or what we call deans or whatever the role is that, that has the skill of working with teachers on their practice um, is this, has a huge amount of leverage in shifting what happens in a school. If I, where, where we have schools where our school leader or our dean is a skilled instructional coach, a skilled teacher developer, and when we have schools where a school leader is less skilled, I, I, within 12 months, I can guarantee you divergent culture and divergent, divergent outcomes and experiences and practices in those schools. And so the, there's a significant high leverage um, uh, impact from investing in the capacity to coach and develop other teachers. And it's not, it, it is an investment. It's not, this is, this is a learned practice, you know, um, but you have to get folks who are able to do this while teachers are in classrooms. If you think about it, you know, if you think about any skill we build, we can only really build through practice. If I'm, you know, if I'm a footballer, I don't train at a chalkboard. I get some ideas at a chalkboard. I go out to the field, and a technical trainer works with me as I'm out there taking shots, passing, dribbling, working, working with my teammates. If I'm a scientist, I, I get better by being in the lab with someone who can mentor my practice in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a lab. Similar in a classroom, I I need, I need that, and it's not what I find. It's not it's not a skill set. It's, it's unfortunately a rel relatively scarce skill set on our continent, right? And, I, and I would, I'd venture to say in Lagos State as well, which is to say that the skill set of being able to systematically coach practice, to work with teachers with, uh, with their data, of their student outcomes and their student experiences and focus, how to focus where, where we learn and give strategies for, you know, everything from classroom management to, to building, to building uh, um, learning, you know, uh, uh, knowledge or to building uh, habit, of, you know, how to help students develop good questioning. Those, those are, um, that ability to coach others is a learned practice, but it, it, it has huge leverage. So I would invest heavily. That, that would probably be my first point of intervention. And, and, I, and I think what you'll find is that, you know, the vast majority of us as human beings wants to be more effective in our work. And so when you have, as a teacher, when you have a, an instructional coach who hopefully is, a, is in a leadership role in your, in your school, um, who is helping you get better, it's highly motivating. And it then builds that culture of saying, yes, I want more of this because I'm seeing this grow me. I'm seeing it have a positive impact on my experience in my classroom, my students' experience and the outcomes. And there will be, of course, some from teachers and educators for whom it won't be that mo motivating. And hopefully we can have a se separate intervention to actually uh, transition teachers who are, not, who are not responsive to that. But ultimately having that point of intervention, which is skilled ability to systematically develop teachers in classroom uh, uh, on the job, is I, I think the highest point of leverage and one that I think is available. Fantastic, Chinese. Can I stop you a little bit there? How realistic is that in 12 months? I, I like the angle that you're coming from, and that's, that's good. But in 12 months, you're talking about shipping that culture. Is it realistic? Chinese. No, I, I don't think you need to... I don't I don't think you shift shape the whole culture in 12 months, I, but I don't think education. I, I'm talking about sustainable continuous improvement, which starts in that time frame. Absolutely, you can you can you can ignite it in that time frame. But I think it takes you want this to build over years, and so I think you can you can build a cohort of of developing instructional leaders. Let's say 40, 50, and within 12 months, uh, 
who have started to get practice doing it and they won't be, they won't be masterful yet, but with practice, they'll get better. And you can certainly hire two or three people in that time frame to coach and develop that, to sort of manage and lead that group. And so, yeah, absolutely, you can get it started. Will you have built a culture in 12 months? No, uh, but you, you can certainly ignite, ignite uh, get momentum that over five years Great. will shift culture and practice across a long season. Thank you very much, Anessa. Thank you very much. I'll move next to um, Dr. Adekolam. I want to take you on your first point, and your first point was on teachers' continuous professional development, which links up with what Chinese just said. You know, so what strategies there? Yeah, I, I think let's start by saying it's not sufficient to have a strat uh, strategies. You need an implementation plan. Okay. In which there will be clearer rules and responsibilities for the type of outcome you want to achieve. And uh, this is very, very important because of accountability. We have two sides, sorry, I'm the bank. We have two sides of accountability. We have the supply side and the demand side. The supply side is what the government wants itself to be held accountable for. That is, the government needs to be more open, transparent, and tell people what you want to achieve for them either for teacher professional development. Like for example, the government can say within two, three years, every teacher or every principal or a teacher, you are entitled for training. So you don't need to lobby. So there's need for more openness traffic. And the demand side of accountability, you talk about the civil society, the non-governmental organizations, and all those people to make sure the government try as much as possible to do what they want to do. So the issue of accountability is very, very important in implementing uh, impl and, uh, implementation strategies. Is it and okay, is it okay so to ask you a question? Let me just say there. this also, it's very okay. important. There should also be a correlation between resources and results. Yes, we need more money, we need more investment, but it's also to be linked to the type of result you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And Lagos has done it before, during the Lagos Echo, Echo. in yeah. which for every school, they know how many of their students with credit, maths, and English. And then for any improvement of your school, it's now linked to incentive to be able to do more. So there must be a result-based financing in which the school and all the relevant stakeholders they will know it's not about investment alone into your school, but it's in the type of result in which. And of course, the, what I will advise also, and I will continue to talk also, yes, we need more money, but are we using the resources we have now efficiently and effectively? Are we adding value to the learning crisis or poverty crisis? And lastly, we, this type of conference, and I will tell Lagos, there are many things you've done before that are working. We should not shy away from that. You, we can bring it back and continue to do it. Maybe at that time, there's no computer, there's no laptop, but the teachers were doing it. So this type of uh, the digital is to add value to existing body of knowledge that you have. Then, audacity. There are certain things you are doing now that is working. You must continue doing it. And then, of course, the future also is very, very important. And that is to connect Lagos, to decide, how do you want to compare yourself? Do you want to compare yourself with international best practice? Do you want to compare yourself with the African best practice? Do you want to compare yourself with Nigeria best practice? Or Lagos is a subnational. You look for countries like Finland that are doing exactly what you want to do and you want to learn from them and continue to compare yourself and you continue to move forward. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Let's put our hands together for Mr. Adekola. I was almost going to take you on the core project, and um, yes. thank you for mentioning that, you know. And um, so I, I'll just skip that because of time. You've already said something around that. Let me well, move let me, to. Let me add what uh, there are three critical elements. Can that I come work? back to you, sir, respectfully? Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Thank yeah, you, sir. Okay. So let me go to um, Ambassador Sal. So you spoke 
about something that I see as very, very critical, which is the relevance of education, which is the skills for the future. So can we talk about strategies and the plans for that? Well, I can share with you the, the kind of the Finnish example, how we do in, in Finland. And um, I think the world has become such a complex place. And the, our challenge is how to tackle the sustainable development goals and the digital transformation, green transition and all that. That, that really requires new kind of skill set. In, in Finland, we have a unit at our agency for education which is only doing kind of future planning, nothing else. It's very exceptional worldwide. They think with other stakeholders, so what could be the future skills that are needed, let's say in 10 years time and so on. It's, it's about future, future planning. But, but and, then, and then in our curriculum, at the core curriculum, which is set um, at the kind of the central level, the agency um, for education level, it sets kind of the core principles, but then it leaves a big autonomy at local level, at school level, at teachers level, principal level, city level, on how they teach, on the teaching materials, teaching methods and so on. So there's this, this kind of a big autonomy which is given for, for, for the teachers and, and for city level. And I think this is because it's, it's based on trust. Um, and, and why there is this big trust on, on, on teachers is because of teacher education. So we come back to that, which is key, even in these future skills. We come back to the teacher education, which in Finland is research-based and, uh, and um, it's a five-year program. So then the, the teachers, in their work, they can implement uh, solutions um, at, at schools level. And, and at the core curriculum, of, of course, these big principles are, are, are set. Um, and on future, future, future skills, what we need in the future, it is obvious that we need critical thinkers, we need problem solvers, we need uh, students which are media literate. We need um, uh, all these kind of uh, issues which are in this complex world are, are, are needed from our students. Emotional skills as well are needed both from teachers and from students. So this is the, the, the skill set that, that we are, we are thinking that we need for the future, and of course then there are all these other issues including digitalization and the green transition and all those kind of skills which are needed for the future. Amazing. Let's put our hands together for her. Thank you so much for that. So I want to go to um, Dr. Ogosaya. You're a veteran and you've been in this space for, for quite a while. So when we're talking about character development, that's so I want you to talk a little bit about the strategies on how that can be imbibed. So it's a specification, but how do we um, ensure that that cascades down for fit for purpose education model? Thank you very much to all the speakers. When it comes to the issue of character development, it's got to be both within and outside the classroom. It's got to be something that's put into practice in the classrooms as well. When we talk about social skills, for example, and we talk about team building, the students have to be put through collaborative education in the classroom, whereby they work in groups, whereby they are taught to be able to do pro like project-based learning, where they are given a topic, they do a research on it, they come back and do presentation to the school, to the whole school, and they, like given a viva at the university. So they are given that, those sorts of opportunities. And in working collaboratively, they learn to respect each other. They learn to respect everybody's opinion. They learn to respect that you are not the lone speaker in a group. They also learn the sense of responsibility because when you are working in a group, you cannot leave one person to do it. Everybody must contribute to whatever is happening in that group. They learn 
honesty, integrity, that whatever I'm putting on the table, whatever I'm contributing, is my own work. It was created by me. I haven't plagiarized somebody else's idea and put it on the table. They learn all of those things by working together through collaborative education in the classroom. And through all of that, they come to understand also that in the 21st century dispensation, but the fourth industrial revolution, it's not just the academic work that matters. It's not only your academic knowledge. That's what I mean by the intelligence. It's not only that, but these skills, this um, attitude, this character development is what will take you beyond the pinnacle of whatever you can achieve with your academic achievement. And therefore, with this, the students get to understand from an early age, and this should be incorporated not just at the secondary, but from early learning years, that children learn to share, for example, is teaching them relationships, is teaching them respect of each other, is teaching them look caring, it's teaching them kindness. And all of this, if we take this from that level all the way to before they get to university, we would have produced individuals in a system that are contributing positively and are therefore supporting each other and knowing that life is not all about competition, um, man kill man or whatever, even when it comes to politics, that we can support each other in order to be able to grow this country into the country we want it to be. And that would be my own recommendation with how Amazing. we can do thank, it. Thank you very much. That, that's in connection with what Chineza said when he said that the skills to shape. He, said, he talked about character, he talked about competence, and he talks about connection, which is more like a social capital that would drive that. You know, and all of this still comes back to the teacher. But I want to take uh, Mrs. Solakwe Hammond on framework for accountability. So there's a statement that you mentioned that what you don't um, what measure, you, measure you, you cannot manage. manage. So I want to talk about the, the measurement for this implementation. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so for us in Lagos, and I think this really started from Mr. Governor's campaign, um, we had a theme agenda, which became themes um, during the transition committee. And then we created a framework of outcomes and the measures we wanted to see so that we could be sure at the end of the day, we got where we wanted to go. And then we looked at it and like, this looks very much like another framework that's very well known all around the world, the SDG framework. And so we aligned it. And so we actually have, and I think one of the challenges we do have is communicating. Um, it was raised yesterday that there's a lot of data. I think Inya Boyeji challenged us, do we know the names of uh, you know, every student? He does not know we can even see them in class. Commissioner sees what happens in every classroom in Lagos every single day. But the challenge is they don't know. So really, there is a lot we need to do, and I think it's great to have forums, uh, forums, like, this, forums like this where we can have these um, conversations and understand more what people want to know and help them to, 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 to know where to look for it because the information is there. But those frameworks exist, and me the, the metrics are aligned with the SDGs, and we report on them and track them. Um, I, I'm glad Prof mentioned you know, just looking at people, the performance of the children, credits, math and English, it's something that we still do. In fact, I think Commissioner for uh, Economic Planning and Budget spoke to it um, yesterday when he men mentioned, and I think for me that really was a big shocker, the movement in the performance of children, especially in public schools in Lagos in 2020, from 39% pass rate in WIAC, in, with five credits, math and English, to 78%, a doubling of that pass rate in the space of a year. That completely busts for me the myth that you can't make an impact on education or on health for 10 or 30 years. It shows that you can. And for me, it speaks to galvanizing action. And that's what I mean by the power of a single metric. That's just one thing that we saw. We saw it come out as a result of the investments that were made, e-learning, teacher training, by the way, which we've done a lot of investment. I'm sure the Commissioner for Education has spoken to this, but I listen to her a lot. Lagos has trained over 4,000 teachers um, at primary and secondary school levels um, and done a lot of 
partnerships, training them on technology with partners like Microsoft and Google. So there's been a lot of investment in teacher training. I know the Office of Quality Assurance, Education Quality Assurance also worked with HP to train um, 36 um, teachers. 18 of them became fellows who then went on to train 300, over 300 other teachers. I, I think some of us might have seen a video trending where there was a teacher talking about affirmations, making the children recite affirmations in school. That was an outcome of one of the fellows of that program. So we are tracking those metrics and they are working. What we probably need to do is to share them more publicly because I think when more people understand where you're going, it's easier for them to align. But I think the last point I want to make around measurement is to make sure it's not just static or a point in time. I think again, Lagos can continue to claim its place as a center of excellence because it has made that investment over time and that's been driven by the fact that there is a strategy, a long-term strategy that underpins all of this. So people speak about the ECHO project, speak about Deepen, which was a partnership with DFID. What we need to also remember is all of this sits within something. So the Lagos Transport Master Plan, all the other master plans and things that we hear about are part of the Lagos State Strategy. We had a 2012 to 2025 development plan. Now we have a 30 year 2022 to 2052, 30 year Lagos development plan, which we will be discussing and unveiling at the Engbeti Summit, which is happening 11th to 12th of October. So this is my small pitch. If you want to talk a little bit more about and be part of Developing, defining where Lagos will head for the next 30 years. Please be there 11 to 12th of October. But that enshrines not just the vision for Lagos, but the metrics we want to see, what we want to see around education, what we want to see around health, what we want to see around transportation. And really that, for me, is the starting point. As Prof has said, to an implementation plan that starts from the strategy, and then you can then measure the outcomes that you are saying you want to achieve. Amazing. Thank you very much. If your hands are not tired, let's put it together for her. So we're going to, one of the things we're going to end up with is to talk about the sustainability of those models. But we're going to take questions. We want to involve um, a few people from the audience. And we have um, a few questions also from our online audience. So if you have a question, you know, we could take you. So while you're preparing um, that question, I'll take the first online question that is here that says that what are the plans for the inclusive education for the special needs people in the Lagos State and Nigeria in terms of low cost tuition fee, in bracket private school, number two, availability of more schools in urban and rural communities with the appropriate and adequate learning facility, in bracket government schools, and number three, employing of special school teachers in the mainstream school. So the question around that is, for um, looking at private school, looking at government school, then the mainstream, the employment of the teachers, what are the plans for inclusive education for the special needs people in Lagos State? Okay. <laughs> I think Mrs. Hammond can go for that. <laughs> I think we should really direct that question to the Commissioner for Education. So what I will do is this. Perhaps what we should do is all speak to what those plans should be, because that's why we're here. It's not so much about what Lagos is doing. It's about what Lagos should be doing. And really, I should have spoken about it. I had here, uh, when I talked um, earlier on about inclusivity, that when we think about, and I love the frameworks you've heard about, so look at the practice, look at the culture, uh, but it's very important that we're making sure we're looking at that for every category because it's very important again no one is left behind so it's the poor and vulnerable it's those who are differently abled it's those who time has passed so someone mentioned adult education i can't remember if it was yesterday or today it's those who learn differently our special needs children and people on on various spectrums um, it's those with different interests. So what if I just don't want to go to mainstream school and go to university, but I want to learn purely digital, I want to learn purely making textiles, I want to dance or I want to sing or I want to play chess. And that's behind our new comprehensive school model which we're bringing back to enable people to be able to do other things that they're interested in or better skilled at in a more mainstream setting. As the Olori said, we must chart a pathway to success for them as well. It's not just providing the platform for them, but providing the end goal. So after you've completed that type of education, you should be able to have a career or something that sustains you and you know, an outcome that you can use that education for. So I'm um, going to stylishly 
avoid that question by passing it on to the other members to the of the Commission panel. for Education. Thank you. <laughs> she can answer that appropriately. The Honorable Commissioner, ma'am. The question says that what are the plans for inclusive education for the special needs people in Lagos and Nigeria? So the person talks about things like low cost tuition fee in, in private school, availability of more schools and, in urban and rural communities, that's in the government school, and mainstream. employing of special school teachers in the mainstream school. Thank you very much. Uh, that's an interesting question. And while I'll try, I'll answer it, I do still want the ambassador to let us know what they're doing with inclusive educators. This is for children who are differently abled in Finland. We'd like to learn from you. But um, to answer the question, can I have it back on the screen, please? Thank you. So um, for low cost tuition fees for private schools, I think, um, I think when we quarrel with private schools over their fees. We should remember that uh, this is a fairly high cost environment. They have to pay uh, to set up a school here. Chinese is a Nigerian. Why is he setting up schools in Kenya and South Africa? Why hasn't he come to Lagos? Uh, it's because, of course, he too knows it's high cost and he will have to charge very heavy school fees to run that kind of school here in Lagos, because don't forget he'll have to do things other schools don't do, like generator, borehole, uh, he'll have to pay a lot for data, he'll have to pay a lot to get teachers who can teach at that level, the cost of land in Lagos and so on. So, I mean, when you talk about low cost tuition fees in private schools, I think you have to address the, uh, um, the, the cost to them of doing business. And this is where the SDG office is working on you know, helping SMEs, because in essence, most of them are SMEs, to reduce their cost of running schools. So I would not, um, the school fees of any institution are, to, are really dependent on their income generating capacity. But for our own schools in government schools, then we can tell you that in line with the free education policy of Lagos State, yes, we do offer free education to children with special needs. We have about, um, we have about 30 uh, primary schools, uh, special schools, inclusive schools. And we also have five special schools, maybe for the deaf, for the physically uh, impaired, and so on. And, uh, and the, each, uh, the challenge to us really is to provide more of these schools. And that's where I, would, that's where I think we should concentrate our efforts on. We, uh, we have recently opened a few more, two more, because they are too far apart. They are too few. And so we'll continue to increase the number of inclusive schools so that in existing schools you can teach more children. Needless to say, special school teachers are very, very few on ground. Because I think there's only one it's in one uh, teacher training school that trains special needs teachers, which also brings us to Lagos State uh, College of uh, University of Education. The VC is here, and I hope you are considering uh, the possibility of training more teachers. So really, we continue to invest, we'll continue to grow, we'll continue to build more of these schools. Uh, they are not enough. I would be the first to admit that. It was something that bothered me right from day one. And that's why we started increasing the numbers, increasing their capacity to take in more children, and uh, increasing their spread across the state. But like I said, there is that major challenge of getting teachers. And we really have to work on that in Lagos State. And like I said, I hope our University of Education is willing to uh, train more special needs uh, teachers. They are quite expensive to train. And, um, but it's very important that we train them. But again, like I said, we'd like to hear from Finland. What we've done is inclusive schools taking children no matter what is wrong with them. Or what, well, no matter what their challenges are. And we try and give them as much, uh, uh, as good an ed education as we can. But is this the right strategy to approach for certain kinds of people, I'm not entirely sure. Then we also have special schools. Uh, we have five. They are oversubscribed. We have our Modukwe Kohl School, which is the only one in Nigeria. And so we have children from all, from across Nigeria. And that school is full to the brim for the physically challenged. We are, we are in the process of 
preparing to build another one in the Badagri area of Lagos. So while we continue to grow, we hope uh, that the private sector will join us. It's an expensive venture for them, and that's why I said uh, regulating the school fees they charge might be hard for us, but we'll look at the possibility of other ways of funding children who go to that school. I think we now start to start uh, have to start thinking about things like um, vouchers and so on, so that while we pay for them, they can go to private schools. These are some of the strategies that we really are thinking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Commissioner. I mean, this same question has about three reports. So let's go to Mrs. Mariana. Thank you. Thank you. In, in, we can come back to this at our um, uh, meetings later on, on, on this, this week. Uh, but in general, uh, in principle, in Finland, the, the so-called uh, special needs kids or kids with learning difficulties and the inclusive education in Finland basically means that they are all in the same class and they just get extra support, and the teachers know how to support these, these needs, special needs kids as well. This is, in, in general, the principle, but we come, come back to that later on. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for them. We'll take one from the audience, then we'll have the final words of all our panelists. So we'll take one from you. Who's with the microphone? Does I need help here? Okay, so Usan, okay, can you bring it forward to um, the executive chairman, okay. um, State University Basic Education? Yeah, Honorable yeah, Alawi. Thank you very much, all protocol observed. Mine is not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, Ambassador, I was nodding throughout your uh, presentation. I had the opportunity of visiting your country so many times, and I know how you run your education. The, the, the most important aspect you didn't have to eat is, is the flexibility of your system. The student play more, you know. They have the opportunity to play around the school. These are some of the things that's contributed to what you are doing. Also, you have a very cold city. At the same time, you have very warm people. <laughs> like I told you, I was there, and the way you have related with us shows us that that is the way to go. And that is the future of education, and that is what we want to share here today. The future of education actually believes and is hinged on our standard of humanity. And that is what Mrs. Ogunsoya has told us. You understand? How are we relating with each other? The love, the care, the concern that we are showing to those people. Those are the things we need to build to build the future. Thank you very much. I am Adijobi L.A. According to Professor Bakari, during yesterday section, plenary section, he made mention of the fact that for us to create this sustainable fit for purpose education model, that quality assurance is key. So, so what is your question, madam? My question is, how is the government of Lagos State trying or will make quality assurance the key? Okay, so a quality, a quality assurance question, and we have a character question. Dr. Ogunsaya, please. Then when you're done, we'll get back to... How to how measure... Uh, character in the schools. Yeah. Like I said, you know, things like project-based learning, giving the students the opportunities to present, observing, monitoring, and evaluation of all that they do. Given awards, the student who has displayed the um, most kindness, we had a visually impaired student in my school before for an A-level program, and you can imagine the, uh, the demands of that sort of program on the students. But there was a student who followed him around, who supported him, who showed, who lent a hand whenever it was needed. And that student was given the award for caring uh, for that month, for that year in the school. So acknowledgement, recognition, celebrating, be it teacher, be it student, whichever way, monitoring, observing, and ensuring that we acknowledge people who do that sort of thing, it can be done in the schools because observations will be made. 
by uh, fellow students, by teachers, and you get people to vote. The best uh, student who has shown kindness most during the course of the academic year. Yes. So that's one easy way of measuring uh, the character that's displayed. By very good. Thank you very much. Mr. Salakwe Amon, you add to that then the second question, second what the question. government is also doing All right, great. for quality assurance. So I think for me, just I think that was a beautiful answer. And to add to that, I think it's important we start to, the, to look at the role of extracurricular clubs as well. Um, many of the stories I hear from my parents, obviously I talk a bit too much to my parents and their siblings, uh, about the times when they used to go and volunteer in homes. Um, I, I think this is something we should, I know we have a lot of clubs, we have over 30 clubs, very interesting clubs, uh, environment clubs, um, a lot of interesting clubs, of course, Boy Scouts, uh, Girls Guild, Red Cross, Zonta, I was a Z Club member, I'm president, um, and we're starting SCG clubs in Lagos. Um, but we should use those clubs to foster this sort of behavior. And I think it's something we should look to mainstream and have some way of um, ensuring that each student is at least in one club. Um, there's a lot of value that comes, as Prof has said, um, when you interplay with your peers, especially when it's not in the strict formal learning environment. That's where you do a lot of your learning. I think a lot of the reasons why Nigerians are so generous, almost everyone has something they're giving to, whether it's from school or their religious organization or a group of friends. I think those seeds were sowed in what they did during the extracurricular activities when they were younger. And it's very important that we mainstream these. So that's something else I, I think I, I would advocate for. Uh, with regards to quality assurance, Lagos takes this very seriously, both at its public schools and in private schools. So, I, again, sometimes people are not necessarily aware, but every single private school that is known is required to be registered in Lagos. And the Office of Quality uh, Education Assurance actually goes, they go to visit those schools, they monitor, there's a framework for how those things are managed. So there's actually a lot of, um, there's already a structure that exists for doing that in Lagos. So I hope that answers your question. All right, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Hammond. I think the Honorable Commissioner would also want to say something <laughs> about what Lagos State is doing quality assurance wise for that, just in a minute. Why didn't you just make me a panelist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the idea. <laughs> to, to include you. <laughs> well, of course, the Office of Education Quality Assurance exists, and um, they actually look into teaching practices across our schools. I think the Finland people will be concerned about that because they don't have any Office of Education Quality Assurance. We don't think we've reached that stage yet. Maybe someday in the future, but for now, we have to monitor and evaluate what is going on in the classroom. But the way I would put it is, and um, we are starting to think, you know, there's the, the, someone has talked about principles, um, uh, instruction, uh, what Chinesi said. Mm -hmm. I think it's most important to start quality assurance from schools. And that was what the ECO, Lagos ECO project did as well. Where even in the school, the principal is expected to be uh, someone who ensures that quality, a good quality teaching and learning is going on in his or her school. So they too will uh, practice some of the principles of supporting teachers in class. And the greatest principle of quality assurance is not to treat it as a, 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 a policeman coming to see the teachers. It's just like, I don't believe that all children should not pass because the way we behave is that it shows you are good when your students fail. Whereas it shows you are a bad teacher if your students fail. So also, quality assurance, I think, should be something that supports the teaching in the classroom, supports the teachers to become better rather than to go there to just criticize them. And I think that is a role that increasingly we're playing with the quality assurance. That's what they're supposed to do. I know schools fear them a lot, but I think over time we'll ch change the mindset. Uh, it's the job I used to do before I became a commissioner, to watch teachers teaching and to see how we can develop better strategies. Oh, you've done well. Can we think about this? It's part of instructional coaching. And that, I think, is something we have to weave into our body fabric. And to add to what uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Ogunsonya, said, because she's, uh, like you said, a veteran in this thing. To be the principal of a school, you, you, you don't have to teach character in class alone. You don't have to say, these are values. You can't say anything. People can pass exams and write what the values should be. It's just like someone told us yesterday that you, you can teach people to swim by teaching them in the classroom 
When you jump in the water, this is what you do. Whereas when they get to the water, they don't know what to do because they, they know how to write it, but they don't know how to practice it. So the practice is more important. And that is why in school, how you run all your practices is what makes a school great. If we look at across board our schools in Lagos, there are some excellent schools where we don't have many behavioral problems because they know that what you celebrate the culture you have in school, the way you choose your prefects, the way you work with even the prefect body, the student body, so there is a sense of belonging of every child in the school. The way you treat teachers, the way you talk to your teachers, the way you support their teaching and learning, all these things make a school uh, a much better environment. And I say it here because there are a lot of principals here that you can run your school in such a powerful way in such a powerful, because the job of the principal is so powerful. You, you, you can change everything that is going on in school yourself. You don't need any QA from ministry. You can run your school. And I've seen it here. And I must acknowledge some great principals I've seen in this place, where their school is their own. And they build a culture where the children feel free and comfortable. For children to pass from 39 to 80 or 79, you know, it's not something that happened because uh, they were just taught in class alone. But it was a sense of safety, a sense of, uh, um, what do you call it, people believe in you, a culture of high expectations. And so I, I, I say it again, that um, it's something that we have to replicate. That's my issue now, that we have to replicate it so that principalship becomes a... It's, it's a profession in itself. It's not just, you don't become a good principal by being a good teacher. No, 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 no. The principles involved, the skills required are so different. And so I think for us in Lagos, we must challenge ourselves that the job of principalship is something that we have to take as a career and a skill, an art, a science, and build up on that. Please don't ask me to answer any more <laughs> questions. <laughs> Honestly, we're done, so we won't bother you again. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to have our passing words, the final words from all our panelists, but I'm going to take Chineze um, immediately. He's about to um, go off right now. So Chineze, are you still there with me? Let's have your passing word, sustainability of this model, and just your final words. One minute, and I won't bother you again. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. And thank you again for the opportunity to join, join the session. It's been a real privilege. What I would leave with is just to, to leave a better message of the power of continuous and incremental improvements. If, if I take, you know, if I have a 1% improvement every day over 30, 365 days, one, one to the, do, do that over 365 days and you, one becomes 37. You know, the, 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 the power of just improving a little bit uh, incrementally but consistently um, every day is, is really transformative and, and accelerates much faster than we think. And so uh, add that with what I think is whatever we do has to be systematic. It can't be, it can't sort of just latch on to individually brilliant individuals. We have to do systematic. But if we can systematically, whether it's improve, work on our curriculum and slightly improve the curriculum, whether it is work on teacher training and teacher support, whether it is work on how we support uh, school leaders to develop their capacity to manage quality of teaching and learning, and incrementally just sort of uh, one percent improvement every day is sort of a, a, my mantra in, in, for our team, and I think the, the 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 how that shifts in the course of you mentioned twelve months is really um, really dramatic. So we we'll leave us with just sort of a, a real um, real uh, sense of belief in the possibility of of significant improvement by incrementally and systematically continuously improving our practice. But thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, thank you, Chinezeo. Appreciate it. Let's put our hands together for him. Uh, we can release you to enjoy the rest of the day. All right, so um, i also like you to know that um, this conversation has been going on since yesterday has been so, so great. Yesterday on Twitter, a lot was going on about this conversation. So it shows that uh, we are doing something very impressive. We're trending as number two in Nigeria on Twitter. And even right now, we're also trending again on this conversation. So it means that it is beyond what we are doing here. Well done. I'll go to um, Mrs. Mari Mariana for your final words. Thank you. Well, I, I, I just... Um, 
wrap up the, the reforms in Finland has taken decades uh, and we still need to do a continuous reform because the world changes. We need to change our system continuously. I sense a really good vibe here that you are doing a lot and, and, and uh, you will achieve uh, hopefully these these reforms and results in, in not in decades, uh, but very soon. And as a, as, a, as a last word, I would like also to, to say that in, in, in this also, public-private partnerships are key. So, uh, for example, in Finland, we have a whole ecosystem um, uh, between public and partners, between universities which do research, and then some of these uh, research, research is being privatized and commercially used at schools and internationally as well. So, so, and we have some of these people and representatives here with us today. So I hope that you also use their expertise in your discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mariana. I want to go to Dr. Adekolo, sir. One minute, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me, like I said, what are those things that, from my experience with Lagos, that they are doing, they continue to do. The first one during the Lagos Eco is peer learning. We don't underestimate the, the, the impact of teacher learning from themselves. They are a resource to themselves. Yeah. Don't underestimate children learning from themselves. They are a resource to themselves. So, all what we are doing, and I think what Lagos has been able to do at that time, is to try to have mentors, coaching is good, the commissioner, my sister, Ronke, and all these things. It's just to continue to do all these things. How do people learn from themselves? How do you know those who are champions? Those who can make a difference in people's life as a teacher, as children, so that they can be able to impact other uh, people's life. And of course, you have to align this with different associations and, the, of course, incentives. The second one I want to leave with, what is doing? We saw that when resources are close those to those that were expected to achieve results, it makes a lot of difference. Yeah. So that at the end of the day, they will be more accountable. But the further you hire Nigeria to where resources is, the more difficult for you to achieve the result. But the closer you are to where the resources and you are imparting the life of your children, you will be able to get this done. Then they also try as much as possible to make sure that at the end of the day, in technical and vocational education, skills development, Lagos State, all other states are coming to Lagos to learn. Why? Because they involve the private sector. It's like chicken and egg. You just don't put children and the private sector are doing their own. You need to provide the right environment and incentive for private sector to make a difference in the life of the children, not after they leave school. It's a deficit model. If you allow children to leave school and the private sector start doing something. Lastly, I want to end with this, and I will plead to the Lagos. We need to make sure we partner with private sector. Some of all these things that Lagos is doing, you are trying, but some private sector are already ahead. They are already doing. What we should do is resource-based financing to provide resources to them and let them deliver what you want from them. So that at the end of the day, you can use private sector to benchmark. You can use private sector to be a resource to public school. And finally, both private and public should be accountable for whatever you are going to achieve. Thank you very much, Mr. Adekola. I had finally three times, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's just so much, so much to say there. So much. He's loaded. He's loaded. You know, interestingly, this conversation was more about implementation. You know, uh, we didn't want to talk about the the private the private sector, but thank you for mentioning it because a lot is still going to come back to your table. Thank you for committing to that publicly. So we'll go to Mrs. Shalakwe Hammond for your final word. Excellent. Um, so for me, I think the ability to, to be the change we want to see is in all our hands. Okay. Um, for example, the Mudupeko um, school didn't start off as a government school. It started from an NGO. 
Uh, my school, which I'm very proud of, my MBA school, INSEAD, was started because someone in Europe thought we should have a world-class business school um, like what they had at the time. It was Harvard, Stanford, Yale, and so established one in Europe. Um, same thing with our Lagos Business School, our first independent business school in the country. And so we will get there together with passion, with courage, uh, with determination to collaborate, and most important, uh, with action. We will indeed, since it's been allowed, <laughs> we will indeed deliver on the Lagos of our dreams. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Please put your hands together for this wonderful panel. We believe that together... Dr. Ogusaya. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Femi Ogusaya, please forgive me. No problem. Your final words, ma'am. Thank you very much. We start with the end in mind. In as much as we're talking about... Uh, fit for purpose education for our children. What are our goals? What do we want to achieve? Where are we going? There must be a roadmap. And the teacher in the classroom must come to the understanding that the achievement of this roadmap, the movement along this roadmap, is all in his hands. And therefore, the teacher must be the one who will take ownership of ensuring that they do the needful. Pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy. Self-development. You don't have to wait for the government to develop you. And every teacher in the classroom has come to the understanding that what they are passing across to the student is information. It's information. It's after the student processes the information and learns to apply it that they have knowledge. And this is a part that every teacher in the classroom must have in their subconscious in teaching the students to ensure there's learning and there's change that's going to take place. Amazing. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. I want to appreciate all the panelists. Um, just like Mrs. Hammond said, together we would get that for the Lagos of our dream. So I'll say together, together, to get there. We'll get there together. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mariana. Thank you so much. Can you put your hands together for her? Mrs. Solakwe Hammond, thank you so much. Dr. Adekola, thank you so much. And Dr. Ogunsoya, we are grateful for that time spent. Thank you.